it's a, a topic that's near and dear to our heart here, collaborative and central to a lot of the work we do with our clients. Um, we also have Edward on the line, who's an expert in this topic, uh, and will be walking us through the content today. So Edward, I'll turn it over to you to introduce yourself and get us kicked off. Thank you, Walter, uh, and thank you, Amy. Um, my name is Edward Wilson, and I have had a very unique journey across higher education, and I've worked in a variety of capacities, but one of the threads that uh, I always hung on to was technology, using technology as a uh, catalyst for change. And so I'm excited to be in this specific role as a strategy consultant with Collaborative because now I get to share some of those experiences that I've had with others and help other implementations go smoothly through strategic planning and readiness workshops. Um, so, you know, we typically have a lot of engaging exercises that help you to navigate throughout processes with workday implementations. But the concepts that we talk about today, they'll definitely be applicable to workday, but they can also be applicable if you don't have uh, that particular system. So uh, with that being said, I will dive right in. <clears throat> Excuse me. So today we're going to cover four main things. Um, those topics include modern workforce experiences, uh, you know, thinking through how do faculty, staff, and even student workers perceive the, the daily experiences at work. Uh, we're going to talk a little bit about service delivery at a high level, but then we'll drill a little bit deeper into some of the details around service delivery modeling, identifying, you know, key attributes related to success, and articulating some of those benefits. Uh, we're also going to talk about the key design considerations. So when you're ready to build a model, these are some of the things that you want to definitely think about. And I'll also try to share some specific examples uh, around customers that we've worked with and you know, my own personal experiences as an HR leader uh, throughout the presentation. So this concept of collaboration, um, how fitting to, to be with Collaborative Solutions, but collaboration and modern technology and having focused solutions are mainstays in today's workforce across pretty much every industry. And people expect this idea of immediacy and, and anytime access and having more insights that assist with decision making and providing general visibility. The consumer technologies are always setting the bar higher uh, every day for every industry. And if you think about different companies like Amazon, you know, they set the bar really high for online shopping. And, you know, they make it easy and they make it visible. Um, Apple, they make their products very intuitive and easy to use and allow people to uh, tap into potential with, with the solutions that they provide. Um, and then there's uh, Chick-fil-A, for example. They, they are known for high quality service as well as good food. And that's a result of great training. But those experiences are, are shaping the way that we experience everything else because the bar is being set so high. So depending on how you approach the modern workforce experience for your staff, faculty, and student workers, there could be positive or negative effects on various dimensions. You know, some of those dimensions include the employment brand, uh, meaning, you know, what's the reputation that gets created by your workforce and how is that communicated outside of your workforce? Um, you know, it could be an impact to the internal culture, uh, culture, <clears throat> excuse me. And, you know, that just means being able to understand what the daily work experiences feel like. Uh, if it's hard to perform a simple task or if, you know, you as an employee work hard and you see others that are being promoted unfairly without evidence, you know, you feel uh, a different kind of way. Uh, there can be impacts to operational costs and, you know, general task completion. You know, if you lose a good employee due to a bad experience, it can be costly. You know, certain positions, of course, are much more costly than others, but, you know, you can end up with recruitment costs, you can end up in litigation. Um, and then the other dimension that doesn't always get talked about is the shifting of workloads. You know, the re remaining employees can uh, end up with a big burden because, they have to do their work and they also will have to end up doing others work and that can have a negative impact on customer experiences. And then in higher ed specifically, you know, when you have bad employee experiences, you can end up with disgruntled and unengaged employees who probably aren't putting their best foot forward when dealing with student matters. And you know, that can be felt by the students. So 
you know, here I just wanted to say that, you know, we're all modern people and regardless of the generational classification, you know, we're all becoming accustomed to modern and intuitive experiences across all of the dimensions of our life. And that's changing our expectations. You know, we want to have immediate access to information. We want to have uh, visibility. We push notifications have, have begun, become super popular. Intuitive interfaces and self-service is really the norm with consumer-grade technologies. And people are bringing those same expectations to work. You know, the expectations around access are consistently growing with smartphones and tablets and laptops powering this mobility movement being able to work anytime, any place, you know, those devices are being connected to cloud-based apps and that's creating a highly technical and highly connected experience. Uh, there's also higher expectations around the idea of improved visibility, you know, being able to have clearly outlined steps and processes, seeing the status of a request, being notified when you need to take an action, or you know when a task has been completed you're being notified so you know those concepts are here and, and honestly they're here to stay for a while at least in, in my opinion um, there's also this idea of an improved user experience and you know we know that fewer clicks to find something is a good thing you know but we also are seeing leveraging smart searches that fill in the blank for you after you start typing in uh, specific words that's becoming pop more popular as well uh, in the workplace and you know, having this consistent look and feel across various applications, that just also creates uh, this, or it helps you meet the need to satisfy some of those modern user experiences. And then last but not least, you know, people don't always want to go through another person to complete a basic task. So we're seeing more empowerment uh, for people to do things themselves uh, electronically. And that's where, of course, self-service comes into play. So technology has evolved as well, not only, you know, from the consumer perspective, but, you know, across the workplace uh, and, you know, looking at all of the specialized applications that wash ashore uh, on the higher ed beach, it's, it's often uh, kind of funny because, you know, different people are building different applications for all of these specialized functions. And that's a good thing, right? But, you know, due to specific budget constraints, sometimes it's not as easy to uh, get a hold of some of those applications, but people want that high degree of personalization, especially when you start thinking about the unique needs of faculty and staff uh, that interface with these technologies. Um, and the internet often allows people to discover solutions pretty easily. You know, I can just type in employee onboarding software into Google and I'll probably end up with about, you know, 15 million results. Now, you know, of course there may not be 15 million applications, but You'll see a ton of paid ads by technology vendors. Some of them are large, recognizable names, some you've never heard of. But you know, one of the things that these vendors have in common is that they often say they have the best, the most easiest, flexible system on the market, and it's a breeze to implement and maintain. But of course, you know, that's not always the case. So, you know, as a result, the IT teams end up getting these emails to discuss uh, new systems with functional leaders. And you know, they're thinking about how can they use this new system to do some really cool things. And it's not really just the functional leaders, right? It's uh, at the end users, the individual contributors who are also finding these solutions and identifying these technologies because they're often looking for relief in their day to day and figuring out ways to do their job better. Uh, so as the IT, so as IT serves as a technology broker and a heavy influencer to what types of technologies can enter into the ecosystem, uh, IT has to be agile and responsible, re re excuse me, responsive to uh, the variety of requests that come their way. And so as these cloud-based systems and solutions enter the ecosystem, uh, the deployment processes may change, the service delivery, process may change, uh, the support model may change. And we're seeing a lot of that as we go through some of the workday implementation. And another element in this, this age of empowerment is the idea of satisfaction and feedback. Um, I can go to lunch at a restaurant and if I have a good or bad experience, I can immediately post a review on Yelp or some other social media channel before I even leave the restaurant. And institutions are dealing with this same dynamic from a student and a workforce 
experience perspective. So, you know, even if faculty and staff don't post comments publicly, um, they are having conversations about those experiences. And um, I call those the, I call that the back channel commentary, right? Or a shadow reputation that's being created. You know, it could be, oh, Tim is so helpful, or uh, Mary Ellen is brilliant, or it could be something like, they have no idea what they're doing in this department. You know, how did they get these jobs? So, you know, the key takeaway here is that expectations are changing and the savvy teams are adapting to meet those expectations all across the institution. So the next thing I'm gonna talk about are some common conceptual definitions related to service delivery, uh, just to set the baseline uh, around what I'm talking about. And then I'll talk about some specific characteristics uh, into service delivery uh, across the institutions that you serve. So this idea of service delivery, uh, of course, it's all about consumers and providers. And at the most basic level, service delivery is about meeting the consumer need. And consumers can be defined as a person requesting goods or services uh, in the higher ed environment. It's you know the employee that has a computer issue or the manager that has a recruiting need or a student that needs to register for classes. Essentially, it's anybody that needs a task completed or some kind of support. And the providers are the groups of people that deliver those services to the consumers. And you know these services can be delivered through self-service, a lot of times using, using mobile applications, uh, shared service centers, uh, centers of expertise, uh, business partners, uh, the leadership of a specific function, or even third party providers when you have to compensate for capabilities or capacity that don't exist uh, within those current functions. So, you know, I, I want to point out that, you know, just because a service is successfully delivered, it doesn't always mean that the consumer had a positive experience. And so, you know, a very practical and hopefully relatable example is that you know, I used to have cell phone service with a particular provider who shall remain nameless, uh, but my bill was incorrect for the first six or seven months when I switched to that carrier. And every time I call, I have to spend about 45 minutes explaining the situation to two or three different people. And it made me feel like a robot or a tape recorder because I was saying the same thing over and over and no one seemed to ever have a clue about what was going on. And so after an hour or so of the runaround, I finally get resolution, but I was never really happy about it. So my point is that, you know, service delivered does not always equal a uh, happy camper. <clears throat> so, you know, here again, you think about some of these key characteristics, you want it to be integrated into the experience, whether that's the flow of work or the flow of life. You want it to be holistic. You want it to be, you know, thoughtful when you design it to ensure that no matter where people are, they can engage. Um, and you also, from an efficiency and effectiveness perspective, when you set up services in a repeatable way, you're able to create expectations around how services will be delivered and, you know, the quality of the services that will be delivered. So it's always a win-win when you have a good service delivery model for the consumer and the provider. <clears throat> Excuse me. Here I want to mention that this, this idea of internal efficiency used to be the prevailing factor, but it's no longer the only factor, right? Now people are thinking about it more holistically, just as I mentioned, to really create an opportunity to engage in the flow of work. And now questions like, what do workers need to work better and faster are being asked? And you know, how are we able to uh, motivate people to do better uh, in, or to be more effective in the work that they do, you know, not being bogged down in processes, but, you know, being able to engage in the meaningful work that they signed up to do. Um, and then lastly, you know, is the experience overall one that you're creating where people want to show up and, you know, they don't get, again, bogged down by the technology or the fact that they have to go through 12 different approvals uh, to be able to rent a car, right? You know, simple things like that. Um, it, it matters a lot when people are doing things uh, on behalf of the institution. <clears throat> Excuse me. So here are a few characteristics that I want to mention. Um, as we, we, we have reflected on specific characteristics we've seen about across the customer base, 
Um, there are three main areas that some of the transformation characteristics fall into. Um, structure, you know, using a model that has tiers that leverage uh, resources appropriate for the level of input that they're uh, providing. And then also being able to outsource specific services whenever it's appropriate, because you don't always have that internal capability to deliver uh, the designed or the preferred service that you want to deliver. Um, there's also this idea of using shared services organizations to be able to scale and uh, take care of those high volume transactions. And then there's also this idea of uh, keeping a, a lens on satisfaction. Like I mentioned earlier, everybody's always talking about their experiences. Sometimes it gets to you, sometimes it doesn't. But you know, again, you wanna structure your organization to deliver services that hopefully provide um, satisfying experiences. Um, the second dimension is process. You know, there's typically a strong commitment to reducing process steps and streamlining approvals. Um, and when you do that, you're shifting a lot of that transactional work so people can focus on more strategic work. And then lastly, there's this idea of being able to use technology effectively and, you know, having people uh, go to a specific portal that uh, allows them to have options when, when they need resolution to whatever their issues may be. Um, and usually you can initiate transactions via self-service and that will allow you to kick off a process. And so you don't have to feel like sometimes you'll send an email to a specific function and that email is gone into a black hole because you haven't heard anything for three days. You know, we've uh, been able to solution for some of those problems with the technology and it often, you know, feels like case management, but it's not always case management. But I've also seen that, you know, there are effective uses of case management tools that are also being integrated into the overall ecosystem. So, you know, no one's issue slips through the crack because, you know, it's easy to say, oh, well, 95% of the time we do a great job. And so those 5%, you know, that's okay, but, you know, it doesn't feel good when you're a part of that 5%, right? If your issue is a serious issue and you don't get any attention or resolution, you know, it, it just doesn't feel good and it creates a, a really negative perception of the level of service provided. Um, and then again, you know, people are deploying modern platforms. Um, we specifically implement Workday um, but, you know, there are uh, a ton of different platforms for a ton of different functions that, you, you know, you may want to think through when it comes to delivering services throughout your ecosystem. And these th these different elements that I just pointed out, um, although those are uh, observations that we've seen, um, that al aligns with APQC's benchmark study on service delivery in a lot of these areas. So empirical evidence supports uh, some of the information that you see here. <clears throat> Excuse me. So why should this matter to IT, right? Um, I, I think that's probably the question of the day. Um, service delivery outside of IT matters because service delivery efforts are really institution-wide. And you know, no matter what technology is deployed, most of the time people think about IT when they think about the technology. And so I feel it's incumbent upon IT to be able to position these other departments for sustainable success. And that serves as a credit to IT's ability to uh, effectively lead other departments, enable them to be able to execute against the institutional mission. Um, and so, you know, IT of course is strengthening their position because they're assisting with the design and deployment of different service delivery models and you know you may have an impact in the student affairs uh, department or the academic affairs department or finance but creating these efficiencies is an institutional typically uh, an institutional thing and it's typically a part of institutional strategic plans as well um, it also empowers internal partners by giving them more than just technical expertise right typically you know they can fix things um, is one of the perceptions, but um, I know having reported to a CIO uh, for about six months, IT does so much more than just fix stuff, right? Or implement systems. Um, IT can be leveraged as a strategic partner who provides structural guidance and helping people 
add a lot of value throughout the institution. And you know that can be done through delivering the right services at the right time to reduce time on tasks, uh, to help resolve pain points across these various functions. So you know, again, that just goes back to this idea of IT creating value all across the landscape and ways that are beyond the traditional ways uh, that perhaps have been occurring over you know the last umpteen years, right? Um, and then lastly, this idea of adapting to the demands of being a technology service provider um, versus being a technology service broker, you know, and providing that high level of consumer level support, um, you know, the types of requests are evolving, you know, it's, it's being more and more complex, you're getting leaders as well as individuals that are bringing things to the table. So how, how IT counsels those folks, um, it's going to have to change and adapt as well. So in the end, you know, the technical leaders of the institution are well positioned to be the change agents that are needed to, to really continue to meet these modern expectations, expectations that are uh, aligned with service delivery. And so some of the differences that I wanted to point out here between um, IT and other functional service providers are the starting point, right? IT has been using ITIL and ITSM for a while, but you know, HCM and finance and some of these other uh, programs may not have been using that type of uh, or those types of standards and you know bringing those departments along through this paradigm shift is going to require a combination of tools and, and models and change management practices and it's going to change the nature of uh, the IT workload in some cases. Um, this idea of service level agreements you know that's huge in the IT world but it may be new to some of these other functions and so you know I understand that being able to articulate or create an SLA is a good way of managing expectations uh, of the consumer as well as the provider of the service. Um, but you know, some of these other other departments may not always understand that value. So you know, using these tools may be a completely new way of doing business, and a shift in mindsets may be needed. So IT can help identify that starting point of, you know, any individual function and help uh, get them in the mindset to shift the way that they deliver services. Um, the second point I wanted to cover here was the engagement process. You know, thinking through how IT typically uses ticketing systems to manage cases, whereas other departments may not do that, right? Um, you know, speaking from personal experience, you know, implementing a case management tool in HR, some of the folks on my team were initially hesitant about it. You know, they felt like it was a big brother play, uh, but I had to explain the benefits to help pull them across that mental line and remind them that, you know, there's a human element associated with this function and people are often vulnerable when they bring a question about benefits or employee relations to the table. And so, as I mentioned before, if that one issue slips through the crack, it doesn't feel good for that one person. And, you know, it's easy to say it's only one person, but when that one person is you, um, it just doesn't feel good. So, you know, having that visibility to know that, you know, you are in the queue and, you know, work is being done uh, is, is critical. Um, and then lastly, there's this idea of uh, troubleshooting, right? You know, IT often has clear black and white resolutions to technical problems, um, but sometimes revolving employee related issues can vary based on, you know, the employee type or, the location or you know whatever the law that governs the issue may be, um, the policy, and there could be a variety of variables in, in play here. And so some of these issues re require a little bit more interpretation and a different kind of problem solving. So you know being able to understand that going into conversations about uh, building a service delivery model in partnership, uh, you know this just kind of gives you that ability to step back and translate information um, for the specific function that you're working with. And, you know, knowledge bases are pretty common in IT as well, and they're starting to get a lot of good traction in other areas, but there may need to be some education and uh, adaptation there too. So uh, again, my point here is that part of the job of the IT team is to anticipate that these core areas are going to exist everywhere. And they're just going to need to be translated to the other departments or functions that you're working with. Um, and IT can serve as that guide to 
help folks start thinking through the process because they've gone through this before. It, it's not a paradigm shift for IT. You know, there may be nuances that are going to be different across functions, but it's not a, a, a huge shift in the way that IT has done business traditionally. So now I want to talk a little bit about some best practices that lead to predictable service delivery and some of the benefits that emerge when you create these models. And you know, I also try to share some examples of you know, how service delivery can impact some of the, or has impacted some of the institutions that we've worked with. So there are a few core dimensions that I want to point out uh, when you start thinking about successful service delivery. Um, the first one is probably the most important, in, in my opinion. And my opinion is shaped by uh, several years of research uh, in the different roles that I've had. Uh, but you know what I found is that governance is huge. You know when you have stakeholder engagement early and often, it typically results in functional commitment and buy-in across the board. And you know the stakeholders are able to clearly identify the needs, which ultimately get uh, translated into goals that people are then mobilized to work towards accomplishing. Um, and, and some of the previous uh, research that I conducted, you know, I looked at some of those factors that often influenced good deployments. And you can have the best technology, but if you don't have a good structure in place to tap into what the needs are of the workforce, then you know, you don't get the type of adoption that you're looking for. You do get adoption, especially if it's required, but, you know, you uh, kind of get people into the system kicking and screaming. And, you know, when you have a good governance process, you factor all of that in on the front end. And so, you know, a good example here is that, you know, governance in, in higher ed sometimes can be a little bit heavy and cumber cumbersome. Uh, in the traditional sense, like faculty governance or even the staff governance model. Uh, but, you know, when you start looking at implementation, there's production governance. Uh, there's a variety of governance models that you want to think through so you can effectively manage your implementation. And <clears throat> without, you know, dealing with all of the cumbersome activity and, you know, the meetings and things like that, you know, I think you are able to get to solutions sometimes um, in a much more efficient and effective way. So some of the leaders at one specific institution that we worked with on the West Coast, they just didn't have the time uh, to commit to that traditional structure. So uh, we collaboratively adapted and created a light and nimble structure that didn't meet frequently, but when they did, it was you know, good discussion and decision-making that provided guidance to the functional teams. And you know, that group was also able to monitor progress towards accomplishing the goals and then determine when pivots were necessary um, as they were moving down the road. So, you know, again, governance is super important. You know, it really allows you to optimize the technology uh, to the best of, you know, the collective abilities of that team. Uh, experience design is the next area that I want to talk about. And it's a natural next step after establishing goals and, you know, creating this vision for how the goals will be accomplished sets the directional tone. Um, this is where the concept of design thinking fits in really well. And design thinking is all about understanding and acting upon the different scenarios that people experience throughout your environment. But you use a human-centered approach that's built on this concept of empathy. <clears throat> Excuse me. And, you know, I like to, when people ask me about design thinking, I like to try to simplify it in a way uh, like, oh, well, you know, try to feel what I feel and factor that into creating a better experience for me as a consumer, right? You know, that's essentially how I interpret uh, design thinking in layman's terms outside of the technical definition or, you know, some variation of that technical definition. So, you know, as, as uh, there was a customer that we worked with on the East Coast and, you know, they had a variety of process maps that they had created, but none of them looked the same. None of them had, you know, personas clearly defined, but it was a really important exercise when we started to uh, think through the design thinking elements and capture you know, what's important to those different employee groups and what are the different scenarios that they encounter. And then we were able to solution for that. 
And, you know, that when you do that, people can feel that, right? Because, you know, they don't feel like you're just funneling them into this one different, one thing that doesn't acknowledge their, you know, uniqueness as a group or, you know, whatever that delineator may be. So, you know, you always want to think through, you know, what are those personas and what's important to them in the design thinking process. And once you design and vision out what that process should look like, you also want to think about how your organizational design is structured, right? You want to make sure that you can have uh, the right level of support for those experiences that you design. And, you know, you, it's, it's easy to say you want to have a, a change management function in your HR department, but when the rubber hits the road or meets the road and, um, you know, a leader brings to you some underperforming function that needs to be overhauled or, you know, budget cuts occur and programs need to be cut or, you know, if a reorg is needed, you know, the real question is, do you have the structure, the capability and the capacity to be able to deliver that quality experience that you've articulated that you can deliver? So, you know, designing your organization to support the vision that you created, to execute against the goals that have been established that meet those operational needs is really important. And then that kind of brings me over to, to the tail end of this and that's, you know, aligning your business processes to accomplish those goals, to deliver on that experiences, uh, to, excuse me, deliver on those experiences and to engage the people in the organization that it's been designed for. So, you know, being able to look at these best practices for service delivery is super important. And last but not least, there's this idea of change management. Um, <clears throat> you know, being able to understand, you know, what are those things that are gonna keep up folks at night as they're going through uh, implementation processes with new service delivery model is, is super important. Uh, I met with a customer last week and, you know, they implemented uh, about, oh, a year or so ago. And, you know, she was telling me a story about how, you know, some of their folks kept saying users won't be able to use these smartphones to complete these tasks uh, around hiring and onboarding. And, you know, that's honestly a pretty common theme that we hear and we pull that into our change management considerations. So and with this particular Midwestern institution, um, they prepared by getting some tablets and kiosks in their offices. And, you know, when speaking with the customer last week, she basically said people responded extremely well. You know, they exceeded the expectations and they probably had misplaced assumptions and those kiosks rarely ever get used. So, you know, truthfully, you know, adoption rates end up being really high with very few bumps in the roads if you start thinking about change management early and often and if you apply some of these best practices that uh, we talked about. So, you know, I, I think the takeaway here is that, you know, it's pretty easy sometimes to make assumptions about the different populations across the workforce and, you know, ne negative labels get attached to the different groups that we classify by age or some other identical um, dimension, but we're all living in the modern world and we all are engaging with modern technology. So, you know, I don't think it's a far stretch uh, when, you know, you start thinking about mobile and, and tablets and things like that. <clears throat> so here are a couple of the benefits that I wanted to highlight here. Um, you know, when you think about service delivery, it's kind of the tip of the spear when you begin creating a model, right? You now have an opportunity to re-engineer processes using design thinking principles and methods that, you know, put this new lens of empathy on those processes. And, you know, when you think about the method of design thinking, it's pretty simple. It's, you know, emphasize, em, excuse me, empathize with the customer uh, or consumer of the services. So you can clearly define what problem plagues them and what that need may be. Um, it's the, the next step is then to, um, create new ideas that challenge the traditional thinking and, and barriers to solving those problems or meeting those needs. And then lastly, you're designing and building a prototype to be able to test that solution. So, you know, I know it's much more complex than that. Um, and, you know, we, we can talk about uh, what that looks and feels like in some workshops, but, you know, those are the high level components of applying design thinking. And when you do that, you can effectively manage the moments that matter across the employee life cycle, right? These moments are scattered all across the life cycle. And when an employee is in the middle of a moment, 
um, you know, if a bad process surfaces and somebody gets the runaround when they're, you know, about to um, go on maternity leave, you know, and paperwork get, gets lost and, you know, all that type of uh, confusion can leave a pretty bad impression of a department, uh, especially when people are in a vulnerable state of mind, uh, like most people are when they go and request for help, whether that's in HR, whether that's in uh, finance, whether that's in facilities, right? People, when you're, when you're in need of something, usually there's some type of emotion attached to that. And so being able to deliver good services uh, across that life cycle in those moments is critical. Uh, as a byproduct of creating a model, you have clearly defined services and processes, uh, also roles attached to those services and processes. And we'll talk about that here um, on one of the next slides, but you know, being able to map out these services that you want to deliver to customer, that creates a bird's eye view for the function. And it's also an opportunity to communicate to the workforce what kind of services that you deliver and, or you can actually provide. And so, you know, I talked about my journey in higher ed uh, earlier, and I started off in academic and student affairs. And I led those functions for about four years at an academic medical center. But then um, I was offered an HR leadership role. And upon accepting that role, I had no idea about all of the services that were being provided. And, you know, they weren't documented anywhere. And so that was my, one of my first tastes into HR service delivery, uh, because I just needed to understand as what are the services that we're providing so we can clearly communicate that to the different people that may be in need of these services and they don't have to scramble on their own um, to figure things out. So, you know, that's, that's one of the good byproducts as well. Um, also, this idea of scaling internal and external efficiencies and creating productivity, you know, I think that's almost a given, you know, when you're able to create these repeatable processes, you're managing the expectations of the worker and, you know, the consumer and, you know, being able to deliver services allows you to track me measures and metrics and be able to make those pivots that you need to make to uh, really continue to elevate the street strategic acumen of your department. Uh, there's also a shift in transactional work and a streamlining of support. Uh, and that really allows different resources to be redeployed and focus on some more strategic work, you know, when you're not to intaking a bunch of forms on personnel changes, right? You can be doing so many other things. Um, <clears throat> so, you know, just thinking through uh, the services that you're currently delivering, you may see, yeah, these things can be shifted if we uh, automate or if we uh, create new different uh, different types of processes with you know, different systems. So um, the other thing is, you know, building out capacity and new capabilities. We talked about that a little bit earlier. You know, that's all about managing expectations, being able to have the right people focus on the right things at the right time. Um, you know, if you create this new opportunity to redeploy people, you can learn, turn around and build out. Uh, maybe your learning and development team spends a lot of time on uh, managing rosters and some of the traditional uh, L&D activities. But, you know, once you implement a new tool, you're able to then transition that team to do other things because, you know, managing rosters and, you know, validating attendance and things like that, com monitoring completion um, of online courses, you know, that isn't a part of what they have to spend a lot of their time on. And, you know, maybe you can transform that function into an organizational development function where you're actually going out and engaging and, and identifying specific ways to provide value with you know solutions from hr so you know again it, it's all about figuring out ways to create space right and these service de delivery models can help you create that space and then one of the last byproducts or benefits that i want to point out uh, is the idea of improving decision making and management support uh, when services are organized and classified um, it just makes for better me measurement practices and new levels of visibility. So you can start to really optimize the people. And when you make a decision, you have supporting data to guide your thinking and rationalize that decision. So, you know, these are a handful of the benefits that, 
you can see if you go through the process of creating a service delivery model. So, you know, one of the last things that I want to do here today is to, you know, talk about a framework, right? I'm going to share a framework that uh, we've used across a variety of institutions as well as organizations uh, in the corporate sector. But, you know, I want to share this with you so you can see how I can apply to your institution. We apply this framework and with workday implementations, but the logic is sound enough that if you fine tune the model, uh, you can apply the structure to various functions, even if you don't have specific technologies in place uh, to create some of those efficiencies. So, you know, if you think back to the experience that I shared when I first got to human resources, you know, we didn't have tools to uh, deliver all of the services, but, you know, that first step was huge, just understanding what are the services and communicating with folks, you know, how to engage on different levels with us. You know, that was really big. It was, uh, I think, a, a, a huge step in the right direction. So, you know, even if you don't have the technologies, the, the classification process is a worthwhile exercise, um, even as a standalone activity. So when developing a model um, based on best practices, the first thing you want to do is identify your provider groups and your services. Um, you know, these are two of the foundational components of a best practice model. And you'll want to identify those groups by labeling those functional groups that deliver the common and, and the specialized services to the consumers. And, you know, you also want to make a list of the services that each one of those provider groups uh, is delivering. So, you know, it, it's really about looking at the different structures like finance or grants management or facilities management and conceptually and saying, you know what, how do we group our services and how are they delivered? And I think that's, you know, a critical element that you have to go through when you start thinking through how to design a model. Um, Self-service is usually at the base of the most effective delivery models. And in most cases, the engagement method is designed to provide immediate access to information that employees are looking for without having to go through someone all the time. Now, you know, in higher ed, I definitely know that you have uh, certain people across the institution that they just want to make a phone call and talk to someone and, you know, handle the problem that way. And that's okay as well. So I think terminology is a nuance that you want to be careful with here. So self-service may uh, feel like, hey, you're making me do this myself now. Um, whereas if you label it direct access, it may not have that same kind of sting. So, you know, thinking through uh, self-service as a way to reduce the administrative burden is, is critical. And when you have self-service functions in place, it allows users to, to initiate transactions, to uh, make changes to personal information. Uh, on the student sphere, it allow students to register for classes or, you know, employees can you know, create an exp expense report. Uh, so you can do a variety of things without going through uh, people to get those things done. And kicking out that process is always, you know, the most positive thing uh, and when you start thinking about, I want to get something done. You, you put it in the queue, or you do what you're supposed to do, you put it in the queue, and then at that point, you're waiting for uh, the rest of the processes to fire off. Um, the one of the other areas would be sh shared services. Many of you may be familiar with this concept of shared services. Um, they're all about operational excellence. Um, they're designed to handle the high volume and routine processes in a standardized way. And that's all about optimizing the workflow, right? Building out the processes to be repeatable and making sure that they're in compliance. And it also helps you to identify and eliminate duplicate administrative efforts, right? You know, there may be six or seven different people scattered across the institution doing the same exact thing. You know, there may be a way to consolidate the work that they're doing and redeploy them to work on different types of things. So, you know, when you have shared service centers, we've seen that it's been uh, super helpful in really providing that high level of transactional support that can scale across institutions. And when those issues get a little too complex, um, they're often punted over to centers of expertise, right? Those are the specialists who drive the policies and, and the procedures that 
uh, employees are responsible for executing in the shared service center as well as in other uh, specific functions. Um, so these, these COEs are you know, often designed to handle super complex issues and inquiries, um, you know, very specific functions. Um, in, in the HR world, they're typically focused on like HR strategy or program management or policy management. But you know, there could be a talent COE uh, where they have L&D, employee relations, or talent acquisition. Um, you know, it, it just depends on how your function needs to be structured. Um, and I think that's another point that I'll, you'll probably hear me say a couple of times before we, we go is, you know, this may be a best practice model, but you have to really be in tune with your ecosystem to be able to create a model that fits into uh, the way that you want to be able to effectively deliver services. So it's, it's rarely going to be a lift and shift. Oh, I found this model. We're going to use it. You, there has to be some uh, massaging that occurs. So we talked about COEs, uh, then there's business partners, you know, they typically are seated within uh, different functions and they have specific knowledge and, and acumen uh, related to those functions that they support. So at the medical centers that we've worked with, you know, uh, and one that I've worked for, you know, there were often business partners assigned to specific units. So the research institute had its dedicated HR business partner and the cancer center had its dedicated uh, HR business partners um, but, you know, there were also some business partners who uh, supported five or 10 different departments. So their main role is to advise leaders on complex issues uh, related to workforce management and, you know, be a liaison with other HR uh, functions as well. Um, and then, of course, there's leadership. You know, they typically are focused on leading and governing HR and, you know, engaging in high level strategic activities across the institution. Uh, but of course, some of the smaller institutions that I've, that I've worked with and that I've spoken with, um, they have leaders doing some operational execution as well. I spoke to a gentleman, he only had a team of two, I'm sorry. Um, he had a team of two folks, right? And so that wasn't uh, conducive to him staying focused on strategic things. So he had to try to figure out ways to create that space. Uh, he was using technologies to, to really do that. And then lastly, there are third party partners that help you fill in the gaps that your team may not have the capability or capacity for. Um, so, you know, th this is a pretty loaded slide, but, you know, to quickly re recap, you want to uh, identify your services and the provider groups, and then you want to make sure that they're aligned to the best interests uh, of your environment, you know, with the services that you want to deliver. Um, the next thing I want to talk about is destructuring, right? This tier model is a way to organize those services by specialized function and a centralized delivery method. Some people may have a decentralized environment that they work in. Some people operate in a hybrid environment, but best practices says to push more towards the centralization because that's where you can start to see the economies of scale come into play. And so, you know, tier zero, you often have that first stop and that's where self-service comes into play. And you have these extremely complex environments, um, but th this, excuse me, this categorization process is designed to reduce some of that complexity. And you know, if you think about you know, the number of actions that can get resolved with self-service, you know, it creates efficiencies and it creates uh, consistencies because you're providing targeted solutions to the right groups at the right time. So you, know, you see self-service and then you can identify you know, what are the elements that we want to group under that self-service. You would have already done that when you created those lists. And so you may have, you know, personal information changes, benefits elections, um, you know, expense reports, whatever the case may be, you know, that first stop is something that, you know, you'll want to try to put into place to make sure that people have somewhere to go and resolve those particular issues. And so uh, another personal example there is, you know, I worked for a couple of academic deans and you know they would often when i started have to build out course catalogs for their programs every semester course by course section by section and they were using about a ream of copy paper to do this so they're walking around with this big binder you know figuring out faculty assignments and so after understanding what they were doing i was able to take that uh those tasks from them and, and you know let them focus on other things like managing faculty 
uh, and conducting research and, and enhancing programs. But you know, I was able to complete that more complex administrative work um, because of the way that I was aligned with the leaders, and they were able to you know do the work that they were wanting to do. But you know, I was able to find new ways to populate those catalogs and faculty assignments with the different sections and also look at data like student cohort metrics and you know allow allow the classes to align with the need and you know that's a big thing in, in academia being able to align with the student needs so you know again tier zero is all about you know the first stop and it is typically the help desk and student services it may be you know the one stop um, and hr it may be a you know call center or a walk-in it, it just depends on how you know, it's structured. And so that's where you initiate those transactions. Tier one is typically the first point of live contact for common issues. Sometimes they field inquiries and provide services to employees who don't have access to self-service. Um, but, you know, navigation issues, basic questions, you know, some of the processing of those common transactions that occur in tier zero may then fall into, you know, tier one for completion or execution. Tier two is the net that catches the uncommon issues. You know, those provider groups in that tier can typically res uh, resolve some of the complex problems um, that require deeper investigation or interpretation based on subject matter expertise. And then tier three, lastly, you know, that's where the most complex issues will be classified and dealt with. And, you know, they're responsible for program design and deployment and processes and, you know, business specific support and other, you know, strategic services. So, you know, this is a general overview of the tier structure with the groups and the services. You know, next I'm gonna talk about uh, the design considerations right as we wrap this up um, that you'll need to build out a, a model. <clears throat> Excuse me. So one of the last things I wanna share today is, you know, when you leverage these best practices that I've, I've spoken about here, you know, it's, it's important to understand this concept of operational agility, right? If you just lift and shift something, you're not creating space. Um, you may create some space, but you often have to take the temperature of your environment and figure out how to effectively apply the right model of service delivery for your institution or for your function. Right, you know, you have to understand those dynamics and mold it around those needs. Right, sometimes you need a governance structure that's heavy to do that. Sometimes you can have just meaningful conversations and identify, you know, what's going to be the best fitting solution for a model that will give you the uh, ability to adapt to the different changes that will occur. And you know, change will occur, and you know, folks will need to adapt because, again, the expectations are changing. Um, the second thing I want to point out is that, you know, process optimization is super important. Uh, when you begin to connect to institutional strategy and bake your processes with institutional strategy in mind, there are going to be downstream impacts. And you'll want to outline those impacts. Some of them uh, are around staffing. Some of them are around uh, budgeting, you know, just being able to uh, understand what the downstream impacts may be is super important. And then lastly, you know, this concept of talent optimization, uh, being able to understand what the ROI of basic talent investments may be uh, is important. And, you know, if you can articulate the value of defining and accomplishing those goals uh, around people, then, you know, it typically helps initiatives get pushed forward. So, you know, if you have a thousand managers spending three or four hours reviewing and approving uh, timesheets or uh, financial transactions, you know, if you took two of those hours away, you know, what else could they do with that time? You know, being able to articulate that is important with uh, developing and delivering business cases. And, you know, again, different people will care about different value um, statements. So the CHRO may care about productivity um, and cultural implications. The CFO may care about cost savings and the CIO may care about process efficiencies and the reduction of technical debt. In other words, you know, not having to support enterprise systems in the same way that they have in the past. So, you know, building that ROI is, is important. And then, you know, lastly, the key takeaways that I, I want to leave you with are, you know, socializing the concepts 
that we've talked about today. We've talked about modern workforce expectations, service delivery characteristics, um, and how the focus has shifted. Uh, we've also talked about why IT should care and what type of value does that create across the uh, institution at large. Um, I've highlighted some differences between you know, different service delivery models, perhaps IT versus, you know, the different functions. And then I'll share some best practices. So, um, you know, if you go out and have these conversations, you may be able to articulate the value of a service delivery model for your partner. And, you know, I think also being able to assess readiness for change is going to be important when you have those conversations. And if you find that someone is engaged uh, enough to be able to uh, work with you to draft a model uh, as a pilot, that'd be great, right? Um, it's a great step in the right direction. So, um, you know, I just want to leave you with this thought of rethinking service delivery is a big part of, of transformation and guiding your partners throughout this process is going to be critical uh, throughout the transformation process. So um, I know uh, we're almost at time here. So um, I'll pause here for questions, but I also will say that, you know, if there are any questions that we don't get answered, um, I'm happy to be able to field them uh, post webinar and my contact information is right there. So, um, Walter, um, are you there? Yes. So we did get one question that came in um, that we partially answered, but want to hit on, on, on it and make sure we really addressed it. So the question was, what recommendations do you have for institutions to initially build a service delivery model, especially if they already may be running workday, but not doing, uh, but doing the work in a, uh, more ad hoc fashion. So I can, I can take, take a first pass at this. So when we do service delivery work, um, as Edward kind of talked about, the first step is really uh, what is your overall vision for the transformation? What are you trying to accomplish? What's the experience you're trying to create for your employees? Um, from there, you start to get more, a little more tactical and you, and you use that vision to drive. What are the different services you're delivering across um, uh, that function, and then how can you better group those into those different uh, structures of support? So decisions there really are you going to have a shared service model? Um, what what are the repeatable transactions that are happening today that can be pushed to self service? Um, starting to to identify your full catalog of services that you're offering today, who's doing it today, and how you can move those to to more streamlined areas, either again self service or or into a shared service center. Um, and a key part of doing that is also then really deciding what kind of service delivery model works best for your organization. Um, as Edward said, centralized is kind of where everybody's moving towards, but that doesn't mean that's the best for your group uh, or your institution. In some cases, a hybrid model might be a better solution. So what does that look like and, and what are those, what does that overall structure of that model look like? And then you can start to plug in the, the more detailed pieces below. Are there any other questions for Ed and Walter today? We'll pause for a minute and let you enter them. Um, we're almost at time, um, but if you have something pressing, we'd be happy to take it. Doesn't look like anything is coming in. Um, feel free to contact Edward and Walter uh, via email if you have any questions about today's presentation. On behalf of NERCOMP, I'd like to thank Ed and Walter uh, from Collaborative Solutions for taking time out of their busy schedules to do this webinar for NERCOMP. Please be sure to check the NERCOMP webinar schedule and upcoming workshop schedule on our calendar online. Thank you so much and have a great day.